morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thanks to our audiovisual team for bringing a bit of Seattle music in there. We were appreciating that, definitely uh, feeling the vibe. Okay, so this morning, we're going to, so we're kind of wrapping everything up. I, I want to do the same thing we did yesterday morning, and first off, ask you, thinking of yesterday and the different, you know, the breakfast here, your boardroom discussions, your one-on-one -on -one meetings, walking in the exhibit floor, what are some things that stood out to you that perhaps you had not considered before coming to this conference that is a, an aha moment for you? Anyone willing to share? We're going to want to get you a little bit engaged this morning. For those of you that are, are still thinking, oh, here's one. Okay, go ahead. I would say for me it would be the growing need for sp spreading the Wi-Fi throughout the properties. That's the common thing I've been hearing throughout the whole conference is Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi. So... Good, we will talk a little bit about, we've got a whole slide and, and topic discussion point on a managed Wi-Fi in terms of CapEx and OpEx today, so that's good. Another hand over there. As you are thinking, and maybe I'll ask a, a little bit simpler question here in a second, but if you wouldn't mind pulling out your phones, um, we're going to do a little bit of engagement here and ask you some questions throughout the presentation this morning and be able to see the results. So either scan the QR code or go to slido.com and type in this number and I'll get the first question launched here. In fact, I'll go ahead and just move over here to the, to the seat. And then Cassie, if you'll switch over to results here. The first question that I want to, to ask is important after we had a, our activity last night. Um, in one word, how are you feeling this morning? <laughs> and I, these are completely anonymous, so you can be completely honest here. <laughs> The, the 220796 tells a lot. <laughs> that, that, that's a, it's a good response. So I think we've got a nice uh, receptive audience here today. We'll come back to that in a second. You can still answer and we'll kind of see how it updates when we come back to this. If you'll switch us over, Cassie. What, uh, let's go ahead and introduce our panelists this morning. Our topic is all about CapEx versus OpEx, and so we've got uh, a couple of different players. So let's uh, start off, Marshall, if you can introduce yourself. Tell us a bit about yourself, your company, your role. Absolutely, good morning, everyone. Uh, I feel like I've met at least half of you uh, yesterday, either through a boardroom presentation or out on the one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings. Uh, but my name is Marshall Friday, for those of you who have not met me yet. Uh, I work for ADT Multifamily, a division of ADT that uh, always piques interest in folks because a lot of people immediately think of either the Property Brothers or home security or we already have cameras in our clubhouse. Uh, but our division is focused on making apartments smart. We put in smart locks, smart thermostats, uh, smart light switches, et cetera, into multifamily properties. And we've been doing that. Uh, we've been doing smart technology and multifamily for about the last five years and have been a division of ADT since the 1980s. So been around for a long time and excited to have this conversation this morning. Fantastic, and then our next panelist today, Justin. Uh, good morning, Justin Foster. I'm the uh, Director of Community Technology Service for LMC. Uh, LMC is a uh, owner operator. We uh, have about 20,000 units or so uh, in our portfolio. 99% uh, of that is new construction, so We've got a pretty young portfolio. Five years is probably the oldest asset. Uh, and you know, we're, uh, our group specifically, we work with uh, development, construction, to ensure that all of our technology needs for the residents are in the designs and then end up getting built and constructed per plan. And uh, that's, that's it, that's me. Awesome, and so we've got a third panelist that will be joining us. Uh, we'll hear a little bit from him, 
Uh, Luke Paskert, who's the Vice President of IT from BH Management, and I've got a little intro from him right now. Hello all, uh, my name is Luke Paskert. I am Vice President of IT for BH Management. Uh, we are an owner operator based out of Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, we have about 325 properties or so that we manage. Uh, we just hit about 100,000 units uh, under management as well. Uh, we have properties in 28 states. Uh, we're mostly in the uh, value add class A, class B uh, assets, uh, doing a lot of renovations and, and uh, uh, updates to the properties as we're coming into them. So uh, I'm really excited to be here today. I wish I could have been, uh, been here in person, but uh, uh, you know, I hope everyone's enjoying the uh, conference. Today we're talking about CapEx versus OpEx, and in the keynote discussion, one of the things, one of the top 10 things was being light on capital. What I found is interesting, as I've talked with our, our panelists here and, and talked to other people in the industry, is that this is not necessarily a unanimous um, position, that there are definitely groups that want to go all in on CapEx. There are other groups that want to go in all in on OpEx wherever possible. And sometimes, some groups, it just depends on the project. And so today, I really want to kind of get into the, get past the surface level and get a little bit deeper into what are some of the friction that you experience within your company when it comes to unlocking technology. And as you see new technology out there that might have a pretty big price tag, what is keeping you from being able to adopt it? And when it comes to financing, our, what we're gonna talk about today is we've got some examples of companies and vendors that know the difference and have learned how to be able to pivot as needed. And, and I specifically wanted to have Marshall talk. My background is also in electronic security. I worked for a couple of different security companies over the last two decades. And, and for those that are familiar with kind of the deeper history going back 50, 100 years in security, uh, is definitely an industry that pivoted well. That if you looked at some old advertisements and how companies, you know, such as ADT, that's been around for 100 plus years, uh, it used to be that if you wanted a home security system, it was $3,000 up front, and you may have been paying five or $10 a month after that. So it was a really big capital expenditure up front, which limited the potential market, but was very profitable. But you saw companies, and ADT is not the only one, but many companies within that industry pivoted over the last, probably about 25 years ago is when it really started to switch over, where the advertising and the, the market uh, opportunities switched to plans that were only $99 up front, like trying to keep that CapEx really, really low. The monthly monitoring rate came up uh, but it unlocked mass markets to adopt this type of technology. One other industry that I think more recently has seen a, a similar shift is in solar panels, and many of you may ha have some experience with this as well, but you know, huge capital expenditure up front for individual homeowners, right? You're thinking, you know, our, our houses that you would have before had to invest thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 up front to get solar panels, and then see the savings over time. But with companies like SolarCity, um, Vivid Solar, really tried to take that same approach in security to say, how can we get this so it's an easier entry for end customers? So with the introduction of um, solar power purchasing agreements, uh, allowing customers to potentially get in with almost no money down, um, but then paying um, on an ongoing basis in order to really unlock the market and get a, a lot more um, uh, adoption from customers. So today I recognize as kind of the lay the foundation of our discussion is that we definitely have different parts of the value chain. There are some of you that are part of the value chain where your decision, we're talking about CapEx versus OpEx is, is you, what you're spending. At other parts of the value chain is you're now thinking of the residents that are living in the multifam units and whether you can be offering a service to them where they're paying 
CapEx versus OpEx. And so we'll kind of move around in different areas and talk about that. So um, to get us started, Justin, will you tell us a bit about your company and kind of your position on CapEx versus OpEx? Sure. We are, as you mentioned, uh, some do every project is a little different. That's us. Uh, so basically, uh, when we start a new community and we're doing designs, so we start to vet out the technology we'll use. We'll, you know, collaborate with development, asset management, get a feel for the budget. Uh, our, our preference is typically to go capital heavy and reduce our operating expenses. And so what we will, uh, you know, typically try to do is if we're, you know, working with ADT, if they have, hey, can we pay five years up front, get reduced rates, uh, you know, we'll, we'll try to use as much capital as possible. When lumber goes through the roof all of a sudden, then some of that capital goes away, and so you have to kind of re, refinagle, but it's really just a collaboration with uh, the internal team's development and asset management to, to determine if we're going a capital expense or an operating expense. Okay. Then what are you seeing, Marshall, as you're going out to the market? Um, people yep. that are on the other side, that's where CapEx is not as much concerned. concern. How have you had to kind of reposition your, your offer? You know, it's interesting. You talked about uh, the different decision makers in an organization, and it feels like uh, the, depending on the department we talk to is, is where the focus seems to be sometimes. So thank you to all of you owners and operators out there who make it confusing from conversation to conversation <laughs> where the next person says, oh, we need it to be more operational it's expense. Me. Yeah, we'd really appreciate if this was a higher capital expense. Uh, so the security example that you gave earlier, uh, and as well as the solar example, are fantastic from a uh, single purchaser approach. Uh, the difference with technology that a lot of you probably recognize is whether or not you're putting the capital up front and, and in an extreme capital example like Justin just mentioned where you say we want zero operating expense, how low will you take the recurring fees if we just pay for it all right now for whatever the extent is, uh, that cost is going to be passed on to an actual resident in some form or fashion, whether it's uh, the initial rent charge that you have, whether it's an ongoing technology amenity fee, uh, different companies run that different ways, but for us, in this example, Brandon, if somebody says, hey, we have a bunch of money that we want to put down towards this, and, and the recurring cost that will be passed on to the renter ends up being in the low single digits, four or five dollars, the companies that we're dealing with, again, depending on department, are saying, what can we expect to get out of our residents for a service like this? When that same company says, what would it uh, cost us monthly if we leased all of the equipment, if we put no money down, if it was just you know, a zero cost to us in the moment, and can we still expect to get the same amount from our renters, or, or should we bump it up to try and keep the same margin there? Right. Uh, so it's a very interesting conversation. So, some markets have very strict rent control where it, it's capped at a certain rate, you can't raise it anymore. Um, so it's. It, all of these conversations that we have are, are interesting to, to see how some companies want to see both options presented at the same time. We want to know right now how much it would cost to just pay for everything up front. We want to know how much it would cost to give you no money today. And then they're running their own simulations on what they can expect as far as rent growth, what they, what they can expect as far as technology amenity fees. And, and it all impacts the sale of the property as well. If, if we put all of this on an operational expense, and we decide to sell the property, how does this expense impact us in one year's time, two years' time, five years' time? So it's such a complex conversation, and I've, I've really enjoyed hearing feedback from a lot of the folks in the one-on-ones uh, the -on that we've had, because this is a new product for a lot of people. Technology and, and purchasing technology is not the same as it was even five years ago when sure. it was... Uh, you know, the agreements, uh, the rev share agreements with cable companies and with internet companies where, yeah, we'll come put it in for you, we'll split the revenue with you. Now they're having to purchase this equipment and the education that it takes to say, here's how you purchase it, here's what you can do with it, has been uh, an extremely fun journey over the last two and a half years for me. Sure. So I'm interested to understand here in our audience kind of what your preference is. So if we switch back over to the poll, uh, question that I have is how do you plan in your company, how do you plan on budgeting technology enhancements to your properties in 2022? 
So if you've still got that open on your, your phone, let's see kind of where your emphasis is. If you're a company that's really all in on CapEx, all in on OpEx, or a combination of the two, and um, kind of see where, where we sit at here in this audience, and that can help kind of guide our discussion as we move forward. <laughs> We're seeing a trend already. And, and then I'll add as well that as we, as we move forward today, uh, recognizing this is kind of a complex topic. We've got microphones, and if you've got a question or you want to push back on anything that's set up here, please do, because we want this to be, the, the end goal of this discussion is hopefully not to put us to sleep talking about financing, but to, to figure out how can I as a company introduce more technology and knowing that finance can be sometimes a uh, an obstacle to try to navigate in order to introduce technology. What are some of the options out there depending upon where my company kind of sits? So uh, we certainly don't see anyone so far. We've got how many answers? We've got 12 answers so far. Um, OPEX is not driving a lot of people's decisions here, no, it seems primarily. Like a lot of new uh, folks developing new communities. Uh huh. <laughs> Does this surprise either of you? Not, not with the, the attendees that are here yeah. at this show. I, don't yeah. I think if you had long-term hold, it definitely changes it. So just by show of hands, how many of you are kind of long-term hold companies? Anyone here? A couple, okay. So we've got about maybe a third. I think another interesting question, though, to Justin's point, too, is when you're looking at new construction projects, that's where CapEx is heavy, uh, where you're, you've budgeted for certain things like this. ADT, right now, uh, our multifamily group probably does about 80% retrofit where we're doing value add like uh, our partner from BH. Uh, we do a lot of value add for them where they're buying B and C properties. We're adding smart technology, getting that rent premium. How many people here, uh, their primary focus is rehabbing and value adds versus new construction? So I think that's where these answers come from when you see the percentage of people here that are doing uh, value adds for, for older properties. Right. This, this new construction is going to drive a lot of these answers, I think. So that, that's a good segue into the, the next question here, which is, do you budget CapEx, OpEx differently for new construction versus retrofits? Let me see if I can, oh, there it goes. And then I turned it off. So let's bring it back up. There we go. Um, the, the, we kind of anticipated this might be the difference. And while you're voting on that, um, would, would anyone be willing to share uh, maybe in the past year an experience where you were trying to introduce technology, but how that technology was being financed became a significant obstacle that either delayed or that you had to navigate through or perhaps killed the, the introduction of the new technology? And anyone kind of maybe share what what was it that they kind of got in the way? It's okay if it was the ADT employee who made it too confusing for you to understand as well. We'll take offense to that. Or the, smart, you, or the smart rent employee. And you can always position it too as like, I had a friend who, uh -huh. and then you, you know, it wasn't your company at all. It was, it was some other company. So we can maintain plausible deniability here. But perhaps a better way is how many of you just have had challenges with financing technology? That that's been, been an obstacle for you? Okay, one, one brave person is willing to admit it, and then if no one else is having challenges, then, then we need to pivot this discussion as to what are you doing to, to help finance technology? Would you be willing to kind of share maybe a little bit more detail <laughs> about what that particular obstacle was? If you, if you don't want to, that's fine. Okay, microphone's coming. And Cassie, we can switch back to the PowerPoint. I mean, for, I mean, I just uh, started getting into the company around four years ago and still earning it and whatnot, but biggest obstacle that we've been running into actually is older properties and really teaching, long story short, what's all the new technology that's coming out which way to go because we, how are we gonna, you can go to the A plus program where you have, you do the whole unit 
or you just go with the smart locks. Which way do you go? And a lot of people that we're finding out is they really don't care. At least uh, in some of our markets in Houston. Okay, thank you for sharing. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, so obviously there's some, uh, we've, we've both talked about the research that comes out from NMHC and, and Kingsley uh, where random residents are surveyed. I, I want to say they got over 100,000 responses in 2019, uh, the last time that report came out. I think Optech in November should be a new release of that report, which would be fantastic. Uh, the, the numbers just from that you know, independent survey were north of 75% for people saying they wanted smart locks, they wanted smart thermostats, they wanted smart lights. They wanted video doorbells. Uh, the dollar amounts that they expected to pay for each of those services was north of $30 for each of those four services. And that's not to say that you can get $120 a month for those four services once you put them together. Um, but we've done a, a little bit of post-installation surveys of customers that we've uh, installed. And it is very interesting market to market, to your point, uh, to see some of the feedback from some of them. Number one, you find out how hard it is to get resident feedback and you have a lot more respect for Kingsley for getting 100,000 people to respond to that thing. Uh, <laughs> but the, the feedback that we get is all over the place from some of these folks. Hey, some of them say, uh, I wouldn't use this at all if it wasn't for the alarm component, which as an ADT employee, I did not see as a major selling point. It's not something that we're really pushing in the multifamily industry as the alarm component. But that's some of the feedback we're getting. I wouldn't use this if it was not for the alarm component. It makes me feel safer. Some people say, uh, I still don't know how to use the app. You know, so it, it gives us an idea that there needs to be more resident training, not just staff training. Um, but for most of our customers uh, that are installing you know, an average of three to four smart devices in the units that they're installing, the feedback overall is, hey, this is nice to have. I'm OK paying the extra money, the, the amount of folks at BH specifically who have pushed back, residents who have pushed back is in the single digits saying, hey, I, I will not have this stuff installed in my apartment. I don't want it in here. Right. Um, and BH has been kind enough with some of those folks to say, your lease is up in July and you will get it at the turn of the lease or uh, we'll help you find a new place, so. Okay, looking at one more poll question is we're, we're looking at you know, why do we want to introduce technology and, and the reasoning within our organization as to why we are introducing technology to our buildings uh, certainly can be important. So Cassie, if you can switch over to the poll. When you look at technology enhancements in your company, what is primarily driving that decision? Is it, hey, we can charge more in terms of rent or upgrades? Is it allows us to be more operationally efficient? Is it, we kind of have to just in order to, to keep up with the Joneses next door and the other, the other buildings in our markets? And when we talk about operational efficiency, we, we've already heard uh, over the last few days some examples of where the technology can drive operational efficiency in terms of uh, leak sensors, of being able to reduce costs uh, to uh, door locks. Um, then when we see integrated door lock systems throughout an entire multi-fam environment, the, the, the ease of being able to rekey or to uh, get people into their, their rooms is very different than what it used to be before when you had to call out the, uh, the, the, the locksmith each time. So looking to see where where you kind of have these. So, so far, keeping up with the competition is definitely the primary driver, but then definitely an appetite for, for being able to charge more, which goes to, to, what, to what you were saying. Um, from your viewpoint as you know, a, a company that is kind of building and usually then selling as soon as it's built, what, what drives you to put the technology into it? And we do long-term hold, so we'll usually build it. We have our own management company. We'll manage for eight to 10 years or so. Uh, and one of our main one is operational efficiency. And, and that's, uh, you can go back you know, three years ago or four years ago, and from an access control standpoint, uh, you know, for somebody to create a fob, they would have to go into the PMS system, enter the information, then they would have to go into the, you know, Cam, video camera, enter that information, access control system, 
and then whoever you're using to manage your locks, and you're entering multiple databases to create one fob. And in some instances, it would be two fobs, one fob for common areas, one fob for the door lock. Mm -hmm. uh, since, you know, in just that short period of time, we've made great strides. Now you can go everything from your property management system, you usually is able through APIs to, to filter down into all the rest of the systems, and then you can enter the information once, create one single fob or key code, and uh, you know, be able to create a credential uh, as seamlessly. You, you can even do, if you're using key codes, you can even just email it out and have a contactless experience. You know, you can just say, here's your email, here's how to get into the property. And, uh, you know, we've really streamlined over a short period of time from uh, oper operational standpoint. And as you looked at starting to introduce some of those systems into new builds, what did the discussion look like? Was it an easy sell to, to be able to say that's what the operational efficiencies were, were going to be and to yield? Or was it, was it an uphill battle? To, I think to... you've got to sell the vision of mm -hmm. it, you know, what it looks like when it's complete. Uh, you know, unfortunately, there was not a single company doing all aspects. And so... You were really relying on a lot of, uh, you know, integrations, <clears throat> and uh, and some hardware to come out that, you know, wasn't on the market yet, and so just waiting for everything to be able to deliver, to for the vision to come through on, you know, I want my resident to be able to get in the building through the building as easily as possible and as, you know, have the, the best experience possible. And who was the champion within your organization for that? Which, which group or division was the one saying, hey, we need this? So uh, our group is usually the one that will, will sell the vision. Mm -hmm. And then you'll usually have an early adopter in development that is saying, wow, that's awesome. I've got the money. Let's go and do it. Okay. And, and that's usually how it starts. We'll have one building. And then... Uh, you know, the division uh, presidents will go tour all the, the buildings that we build, and then it kind of starts to filter down a little bit. So, Marshall, as you deal with potential buyers of your product who you, you have someone who's excited about it, but now you've got to try to get them to evangelize it to the rest of the company. What, what are some tools to um, help remove those roadblocks when it comes to, to financing? <clears throat> you know, it's uh, an interesting point. When you're buying technology, I, I, I've never worked directly for an owner operator in the multifamily space, but I imagine that buying technology is similar, but different uh, from buying floors, from buying counters, from buying appliances, from buying toilets. Uh, so we are, are having to talk to different divisions about whether this is gonna be a revenue driver for them or not. And to Justin's point, uh, he talked about operational efficiency. You see that answer coming up more often in people who are already uh, fully on board with technology where a lot of folks think uh, and th none of these are wrong answers, by the way, on, on why technology enhancements are coming through, but a lot of people think at the beginning of their adoption, at least the customers that we have, say, I have to do this to keep up with the competition, and I think it's going to drive revenue. The amazing thing afterwards is you realize through APIs, through the technology that's going in there, uh, we are saving time from rekeying locks. Rekeying locks is now as simple as pushing a reset button on a, a dashboard somewhere instead of sending somebody out there you know, pulling the lock out, rekeying it, changing it out, and spending somebody's time out there. AC issues, uh, not having to have somebody go from the ground floor to the fourth floor to turn the AC unit on, to come back down and see if the fan's working, to go back up to turn it off to see if the coil got cold. You see exactly what's going on. Right there. You're flipping it on and off from your phone while you're at the unit itself. And so operational efficiency ends up becoming uh, what a lot of our customers say is the reason that they're going to continue moving through the portfolio with stuff like this. Sure, it's great to drive the revenue, um, but depending on the market that we're in, some folks say, what's an extra 50 bucks a month right now? I mean, rent's $2,500 here. 50 bucks a month is not making or breaking the bank for us, but if we can start saving $50 a unit and driving $50 in revenue a unit, now it's $100 a month. We've right. doubled that, uh, that savings that we expected here. So that's what ends up... Uh, becoming a big part of the conversation is that operational efficiency on the back end. Justin, as you see uh, multiple, having multiple units, do you have certain technology that has unlocked, instead of having a single person at each property having to manage a certain thing from a technology perspective, that 
you've now been able to kind of move that up where you've got one person who's now managing that particular thing across multiple um, properties that, that is helping drive some operational efficiency. So loaded question being that we're the, the operator as well. Uh, so we, we definitely, you know, honestly around self-guided tours, we've had a lot of pushback internally from the management team uh, being that, hey, if you can use technology to get somebody in, tour, leave, follow up uh, to that point, you could probably uh, you know, get rid of some staff. Uh, so, so that has definitely been an, you know, an issue just internally and in having to sell that, no, you know, it's, it's really for the, the folks that are more comfortable purchasing you know, without having somebody there. And, and honestly, you know, COVID kind of drove us to accelerate self-guided tour. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think that the, the technology definitely helps, but then it's, you know, how you massage that message uh, internally. And for your company, how has that transition to self-guided tours been? Has it been a successful one? Is it, is it surprising or kind of... It, it's, it's, uh, it's all over the map. So we have some that it's extremely successful. Uh, you know, our most successful one is in Phoenix. Uh, it's majority student and 80-something uh, percent uh, of the folks that end up signing leases were from self-guided tours. Other places, the uh, on-site team has just never really embraced it. And so, you know, it's just the, the constant of training, you know, kind of getting the message out. And so so one possible. thing is potential buy-in of, of your team, but then also the, the demographic of, that's being sold to, and that kind of back to the I see it as a, a job team. eliminator, so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, that's an interesting point. Uh, a lot of the companies that I've talked to, again, getting into the different divisions of that organization, uh, will have conversations with me about centralizing a leasing function, right? So when you talk about success in an Arizona market, for example, uh, rather than having three leasing agents working a large property at all time, uh, you can have one person there for those folks that want to do in-person tours and a centralized group of folks that is doing follow-up phone calls, follow-up emails, follow-up text messages. Once that centralized group takes over 10 properties in a, a, a small footprint or a small region, you're dropping two leasing agents at every single one of those properties, getting rid of 20 headcount, and you just need five people to follow up with all the self-guided tours. So it's, it's a reality of what's going on right now. There are a lot of jobs that are displaced by technology, but I think that the multifamily industry will find new ways to employ folks around this technology. So I right. think one of the, the smallest groups right now, and maybe, maybe we can do a, a question on this yep. uh, on Slido, but there are not a lot of companies that I have worked with that have departments that have dedicated, you know, technology innovation departments, it's, it's usually someone in procurement or someone in finance or someone in asset management who is tasked with, uh, you know, discovering the next technology and bringing it to the team. So maybe the question would be, uh, you know, is there a team dedicated to, uh, you know, technology discovery or is it up to everyone to bring something to a meeting and say, hey, we found this new technology, do we want to try it? Um, to that point, uh, there are companies out there today that are offering services like this. And, and one small business that I can think of right now is a company called Innovative NOI that basically says we are a uh, innovation team for hire. Short-term hiring, if you want us to come in and assess any kind of technology that you're looking to buy, we'd love to do that for you. Uh, and you hire them on a contractual basis to say, are we gonna make money from this? What kind of operational expenses can we expect to reduce? Uh, they give an unbiased opinion and then throw out all of the companies that do something like that so then those buyers can go look at the companies and say, is this something that makes sense? Um, interesting, out of seven people, none of, the, none of the companies represented in this room have anyone, uh, any teams dedicated to kind of technology discovery or, or technology. If anyone uses a consultant to help with technology consultant, needs. Consultant, yeah. yeah and that's, I, yeah, that's, that's the kind of concept that I'm talking about here. Yeah, yeah, and that's, you know, that's how our group was formed, to be honest, as we worked for a consultant before we were brought in in-house. Uh, and so, and that's how our, our group was, was formed. So let's, let's change gears and go to the one question that was brought up earlier on about managed Wi-Fi. So uh, 
tell us a little bit about your journey with managed Wi-Fi. What point did you start adopting that? What were the, the drivers that led you to, to driving that? And then last, what are the benefits you've seen from managed Wi-Fi? Yeah, so uh, at LMC, we, we don't have a property with managed Wi-Fi today. We are going down that path. Uh, well, probably a year and a half, the development cycles are not allow you to adjust too terribly quickly to technology, but we're probably a year and a half from having our first community past life. I worked in the student industry, so very familiar with managed Wi-Fi. And, and I think this is where your, your CapEx and your OpEx really kind of uh, start to, uh, you know, have to make decisions because a, a lot of owners will go capital heavy on a new development with managed Wi-Fi. So you'll, you'll put, say, 150000 down to buy the equipment. You're buying down your rate as low as you can, 10 bucks a unit, 15 bucks a unit, whatever it is, uh, five-year term. Uh, but but what, a, what a lot missed the boat is, hey, at, at five years, uh, you know, now I've got to renew. Things, yeah. I've got to renew my contract, and I've got to refresh. Hopefully, I put all those acorns in the bank to to pay again. If not, then your rate's going to jump from you know fifteen to thirty bucks or thirty-five bucks. Uh, and, and I've seen a lot of from the consulting side and from the past life. I've seen a lot of owners get kind of burned by their opex just going through the roof because they didn't anticipate that technology refresh. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a good question back over to the security industry, where security has definitely gone from a point where 25 years ago, it was like, give you a panel. Mm -hmm. The panel may have cost 100 to $200 to, to you. And for, for years, it was that panel is going to last you two decades. You know, it's the little LCD screen and the little 10 buttons. But over the last, you know, 11, 12 years, it's now transitioned to a security panel that's a touch, that's color screen, and that at about a five-year rate needs to be um, refreshed. How are you handling that from a, how do we charge the customer so that we can have this planned obsolescence yeah. of our equipment? You know, it's interesting when you talk about um, the original security panels that were out there, and I've been at ADT for 15 years, and we were still on the old LCD screen back then, right, 10 buttons on there. I had in my house for years after that even. The new stuff that's coming out right now, shout out to uh, Qualsys, Johnson Controls, I don't know if, if they're in here, but uh, ADT works with Qualsys uh, as well as 2GIG, if you guys are in here, so shout out to my, uh, my product teams. Uh, the, the products today, Brandon, are fantastic because a lot of what we're putting in from a smart home perspective works off of software updates over the air. Uh, I have never purchased a brand new iPhone that is the one that just came out. I wait until the new announcement. I think they just announced whatever number 13. they're on right now, 13. Uh, now's the time for me to go buy an 11, right? Because it's going to work the same as the 13. The camera's gonna be a little bit uh, less quality. There's gonna be a little bit slower processing in there, but it's faster than the seven that I have right now. So you, uh, for me, uh, when you think about software updates, I don't know if I should have even said that as a technology guy, but uh, regardless, when you, no, let's when you, go buy the new yeah, one. When you think about uh, the the updates that are over the air these days, the technology is not changing by leaps and bounds. If you took an iPhone 7 and put it next to an iPhone 13 right now, the camera quality is better, the processing speed is faster, the memory is bigger, uh, but the phone still operates exactly the same. And as long as you're doing software updates. The interface looks the same for the, the end user, et cetera. The, the Bluetooth devices still work with it. It still has all the same general functionality. On the uh, smart technology space, that's what a lot of operator or a lot of integrators are doing right now is partnering with companies that have fantastic roadmaps. There's new product coming out. There's a way that we're going to make it better. But those companies are also committed to the customers that we have to make sure that software updates continue to keep their technology fresh for longer. And the commitment uh, to backward exactly, compatibility. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't had any of our suppliers of, of our products who say, hey, this new thing that's coming out is going to create you know, a big issue for all of your customers that you've worked with before. Um, and again, since we've been installing in multifamily since the 1980s, there are some folks out there who still have working product that you would not, 
you'd go in there and say, this still works right now. It's, it's yellow, it's older, <laughs> but the software updates are working on it. We're upgrading the communication technology from old 3G to 4G and 5G. But it's, it's not something that I think is as big of a barrier as some folks may think it is, right? It may say, I don't want to put this in because next year you're going to come out with something newer. Uh, I think this industry as a whole has done a great job of allowing all of our existing customers to update with over-the-air stuff, very simple patches, very simple fixes. So what then do you see as a good translation from that to some of the challenges in managed Wi-Fi, particularly there's some similarities in that you've, you want to get the managed Wi-Fi out to a lot of existing customers, existing buildings, but trying to figure out financially how to make that possible, either the first time or refreshing it. Either of you have thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, so I think uh, a lot of that is current contracts, right? I mean, we've all got current contracts with existing providers. Uh, most of those are fairly lengthy. Uh, and so, so you really have to, to look at your portfolio target when you have contracts expiring Hopefully they all expire at the same time. Uh, <laughs> and, then, and then really target a date that you want to transition uh, because unfortunately the providers always put this language in there about anti-bulk. But uh, you know, you, you will, it really just takes time to sit down and know your portfolio and know your contracts and say, okay, this one's good to go this date. And then you can start worrying about the finances. Okay. As you as you kind of indicated, you're you're pushing your your company's moving towards managed Wi-Fi. What is it that is is driving that change? What what are the the benefits you expect to achieve from that? So the uh, instant on just the so the resident moves in. It's I it's the hotel experience, right? Mm -hmm. You go in, you have uh, you sign in, you have Wi-Fi, you have Wi-Fi through the entire building. You go to the pool, you're still connected to the same Wi-Fi. You have all your devices on your own little personal network. Uh, you know, it, it's a seamless experience and a better experience for the resident. Plus, from an owner, then I'm able to use that network for more efficiency on my side. I can put all of my IoT devices on it. Uh, I can put, you know, now I've got generators that need connectivity, boilers that need connectivity. I've got all, all sorts of, every project seems to be some new device that needs internet that never did before. Uh, and so it's too, you know, for me, it's really more of a, uh, the resident experience and then the building efficiency we get off of it. Uh, to, to that point, I can't remember who it was that I was talking to yesterday in a one-on-one, -on -one, but a fantastic point was brought up about this whole managed Wi-Fi experience. I think um, without great communication uh, from all parties involved, from construction through lease up, through stabilization, I think someone makes a decision that managed Wi-Fi is a great idea. Uh, and then again, with all the decision makers that get involved, everyone trying to say, hey, I found this new technology, I'd like to bring something forward. When you get to the end of a construction project, now there's already 50 connected devices per unit, and you're saying, who bought the smart appliances? Who, who bought the smart light switches? How did we not realize that there were going to be 50 devices that are connected already? And you can start to clog up that bandwidth for customers, uh, where every wireless access point in the building now is, is jammed with too much smart technology. So you have to make sure that uh, you don't get to the point that residents move in and they say, this Wi-Fi is slower than if I just stayed on my own cellular network yep. right now. So an important call out. Uh, that somebody mentioned to me yesterday, I thought it was fantastic. I didn't even think about who we're competing with in the space. Uh, if somebody says, hey, we want to add ADT smart technology into these units, and I don't think about the fact that we're competing with a potential LG refrigerator or uh, you know, a smart speaker that's going in there or the 25 devices that these residents are going to bring into the unit and connect to the Wi-Fi as well. So something to keep in mind as you go through that. Yeah, for sure. Um, Kazi, if you can switch over to the PowerPoint, I'm going to jump ahead a few two different slides here. We, we haven't heard from Luke too much here, but Luke's uh, company has, and we'll jump through here, this is all things we've, oh, we didn't talk about this, but we'll talk about new construction, talk about managed Wi-Fi. Um, so Luke's company has been uh, adopting managed Wi-Fi, and he's uh, got a little bit of uh, commentary here on what benefits they've seen and what the ROI has been as they've introduced managed Wi-Fi to their properties. As we've seen, the as a service model and subscription models, 
uh, are continuing to produce great revenue for the companies that are uh, putting those out as options. And I think from our standpoint, uh, we continue down the path of looking for opportunities such as the managed Wi-Fi, property-wide Wi-Fi. Um, those we're seeing very good returns on. And we're also seeing uh, that we are able to offer a far better service than what the uh, standard individual internet uh, circuit is, is able to offer. Uh, you know, when you have uh, a resident that has a 50 meg service uh, individualized, and they're having problems, uh, they're having to sit online or on hold with uh, the provider to get those uh, resolved. Whereas with the managed Wi-Fi solution, uh, we can provide uh, at a better price, we can provide gig internet uh, that is managed by a 24-7, 365 knock. Uh, they're able to know if that uh, device is online, if that resident's having issues, and they're able to uh, create a much better experience. So we're seeing really good uh, returns on those investments. Uh, and I think, you know, as we continue down the path, um, the things that, that the residents are wanting in that high quality streaming, high quality uh, services, I think we're going to continue to see those be strong revenue generators. So, Justin, as you look at the technology you're incorporating into some of your current builds, which of those are most likely to have an impact on, on raising rent and being able to, to, to tr attract additional revenue? I think the, the managed Wi-Fi uh, you know, definitely has potential. Uh, and then uh, the IoT devices. I think you know, uh, electronic locks, I may be wrong, but I think electronic locks are pretty standard now, so everyone kind of expects them. And table Same with, Yeah. So I think it's really just more of, uh, you know, the, the thermostat control, and then and then if you have the managed Wi-Fi, all the thermostats can be on uh, that network, and then when it's vacant, I get control of it, so then I get some more operational efficiencies uh, from that. Uh, but, I you know, I, I think that it's really the managed Wi-Fi has potential to drive quite a bit of revenue, if you're if you're good about uh, planning for refreshes. <laughs> Flipping over to ADT, I mean, I kind of know what your answer might be on this, but do you have some specific examples where you've had uh, customers that have made their multifamily units smart homes and have seen success in, in charging more for those those benefits? Yeah, the, the average that we're seeing rents go up, uh, and, and a majority of our customers, a lot of the early adopters, believe it or not, are not in the high-tech areas, are not necessarily in the, the, the coast. The mid-Atlantic, the southeast, and Texas have been the fastest adopters, and we're getting into the southwest now, uh, have been some of the fastest adopters of this technology. I think one reason is they have room to grow their rent. Uh, a lot of coastal cities, uh, like I mentioned earlier, are under some kind of rent control or they're already maxed out at what they're charging and, and $50 to $100 is even a nominal fee. Uh, but most of our customers are charging between $35 and $55 a month for these type of services. Uh, there's almost zero pushback on, on what they're getting from that. Um, but the big surprise, like we talked about earlier, is that operational savings. So one smart product that you can uh, implement into your portfolio is smart leak detectors. Uh, they go in drip pans for hot water heaters, they go into overflow pans for AC units, they go in under sinks, behind dishwashers, behind washing machines. They're very simple products, you can put them anywhere, and, and we're getting more into flow control now as well, so you can yeah, start to see slow leaks that are happening. But with these leak detectors, uh, water damage I think is the number one claim in multifamily right now. Uh, it surpassed fire a couple of years ago uh, where water damage is the number one claim. And we have customers, uh, BH actually had a leak at the next property that we were going to install. We're doing one in this city, that's the next property we're going to go to. And they told us the leak that happened just prior to the installation, the, the cost of incurring that leak would have paid for the entire implementation of that smart technology for the next five years. So it's amazing to me yeah. to think about the risk mitigation that you get from smart technology. Um, to answer your question, we've, we've seen some folks charge as high as 80 to $100 a month. Most people are, are between that 30 and 50. So from a revenue perspective, uh, obviously smart technology is driving that, um, but the, the operational savings that can come from this, just from an early detection, rather than 
the guy in unit 101 calling the front and saying, hey, I think something's coming through the ceiling here, and maintenance grabs a dumb key, right, and they go out to unit 201, and they open it, and they say, oh, it might be 301, so they got to run back to the office, <laughs> grab, grab 301. Now it's early detection, maintenance is getting a notification, the resident's getting a notification, uh, they're getting up there and shutting the water off right away, saving the, the resident the headache, yep. all uh, huge portions of insurance claims, and that's just one smart product and how it's impacting the industry. I mean, I've got firsthand experience with that, having a, it was a Qualsys panel, it was like seven years ago, one of the first ones, and had a, uh, we were living in Pennsylvania at the time, we had a sump pump in the basement, and remember the security alarm going off at 1 a.m. in the morning, and kind of first panicking, like, what's going on, and then looking at my device and being like, oh, it's the, it's the flood sensor in the basement, and go down there, and the sump pump elbow had popped off and was just spurting water everywhere, and I got there within 60 seconds, and it was yep. pop it back on, one towel, whereas without that, you know, how long would it have been until I went down to that basement and yep. found out that it had been leaking all over the place, and, you know, you do that on a multiplicative scale across multi-fam, and the amount of, like you said, the amount of damage that can happen, you know, within 24 hours is just astronomical, so it's, it has good payback. And the, the flow rate, so to your point, the flow rate and shutoff valves is something that's driving us for Wi-Fi, too. I don't know if there's to my knowledge, there's not one that's on the market that's not Wi-Fi, because uh, it just, it, you capture so much data that it, it, you need Wi-Fi uh, to be able to, to utilize those. And I see a huge value in, you know, every single unit detecting an anomaly and being able to shut off water, investigate it, and uh, reduce leaks. All right, so as we're getting towards the end here, what questions might you have in our audience for our two panelists here at the table? Any other challenges you have within your organization when it comes to financing technology and balancing that CapEx versus OpEx? Um, just curious for multifamily, if, um, for, if you are switching over to managed Wi-Fi and obviously with the IoT devices, are you adding on like a separate line item charging for that or are you rolling it into the rent? Which are you guys typically doing? Yeah, so there's been a lot of discussion about that actually. Uh, so when we uh, first launched, we launched with the individual line item. It was not received very well. So then we just rolled it into the rent. And Katie, how, how have you guys done it in student housing? Just kind of For students, it's always, we've always had it rolled into the rent, but we always also include, you know, electricity. And, I mean, we have, a, it's, there's a number of line items that are rolled into that one rental payment for us, but we're entering multifamily, so I was curious. For, by show of hands, how many of you already have managed Wi-Fi in some of your properties? Okay, and of those that have managed Wi-Fi, how many of you are rolling it into rent versus um, a separate line item? So rolling into rent, separate line item. Okay. Other questions? Wrap up, any kind of takeaways um, that kind of the last words of wisdom that you would give this audience? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, the, yeah, again, not words of wisdom, just uh, thoughts from a, a dude who's worked at ADT for a long time. Um, I, I would say all of the technology companies that you guys are talking to out there today uh, uh, in the boardrooms and at the trade show are very interested in uh, understanding how you purchase, uh, how you plan to implement, and all of us are very flexible with how we will help you implement that. So whether it's um, saying we've got a bunch of value-add properties that we picked up through acquisition, we want to do something to bring them uh, up to par, we want to compete with the, the other properties in the area, maybe some nicer Bs or some A-minuses that are in the area and you want to try and get rent closer to that, we are more than willing to try and help from an operational standpoint. Do you want to take all of the cost of this and spread it out? I know nobody answered the question that way earlier, but there's a lot of new construction in here. Uh, from a capital uh, expenditure standpoint, ask us the question, like Justin mentioned earlier, how much will you save me if I give you all the money right now? You, you might be surprised at the answer. We, we are very happy when we don't have to worry about attrition. So if you want to give us all the money up front and, and we're guaranteed to get paid for five years of service, we're willing to give you a hefty discount. So all of the companies that are here this week work that way. All of us are, are, are at these shows on a regular basis because we love the fact that the multifamily industry is finally coming around to technology. Um, this is a, a very close-knit industry. It's people that uh, have 
been laggards. Uh, you know, the adoption curve is, is very much still in the innovator phase and early adopter phase, but we're getting to that point in the bell curve, I think, where uh, there's gonna be a hockey stick approach to not just smart home technology, but also managed Wi-Fi, uh, some of the other technology solutions that are presented here at Tech Home this week. So uh, jump on the bandwagon. It, I mean, obviously it's, it's coming whether you want to or not, and I think a lot of people realize that by the way they answer some of these survey questions. And we did a similar event in Louisville uh, a couple months ago, and I had on as a, a similar panelist, uh, Frank from DISH, and talked a bit about that as well, is that they, they can you know, convert an offer um, and swing it to CapEx versus OpEx, depending upon your needs. And, and as you see vendors able to do that for you, make sure you're also keeping in mind, you know, if I have customers who are sensitive to this either way, can I give them options as well? And that, that may be make your, your particular development more attractive to them to the other, than others. Okay, as we wrap up today, it's, it's time.